Okay, good afternoon. It's a great honor for me to introduce Aaron Brennan, my former student who studied European history and particularly Irish history here at UCSC. Uh, and she'll be giving our keynote talk this afternoon. Um, Aaron went on to build a distinguished career in the complementary fields of urban planning and historical preservation. She came to UCSC from Bloomington, Indiana, spent a year abroad on EAP at, the, uh, at Galway University, wrote a brilliant research paper on the decline and revival of the Irish language and the politics of that, did her graduate work at the University of Virginia. She became interested in architectural history during her year in Galway, a medieval town whose beautiful civic center has preserved elements of Romanesque, Gothic, and Renaissance styles. She has published articles on architectural history and historic preservation, uh, and she's done a, a lovely pictorial history of Charlottesville, Virginia for um, the wonderful uh, Images of America series. And she's worked as an urban planner and preservationist in Charlottesville. She's directed or participated in a nonprofit that's helped the government of Jamaica to develop architectural guidelines to preserve the stately Georgian architecture of the port city of Falmouth on Montego Bay. Since 1911, Erin has been an architectural historian um, and an urban planner with AKRF Incorporated, which is an environmental engineering firm based in New York City. Um, she's worked on uh, the World Trade Center Redevelopment uh, Project. She's also worked on the Staten Island Observational Observation Wheel, um, and also my own home county, which is Suffolk County, on its first comprehensive um, plan. Uh, in all of those cases, she's looked at the impacts of those projects on uh, historical resources on the natural environment and the social fabric. Wherever she's lived and worked, Bloomington, Santa Cruz, Galway, Charlottesville, Falmouth, and now the great city of New York, Erin has been fascinated by the built environment and its evolution over time. She's shown that it's possible to combine ambitious development projects with a sensitivity to history, even in New York, which until recently has torn down more historic buildings than any other city on the planet, with the possible exception of Bucharest in the time of the dictator Ceausescu. But Erin, thank goodness, has put a stop to all of that. She provides a model of how one can build on training in history to shape a distinguished career. Please join me in welcoming back to UCSC, Erin Brennan. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Bruce. It is um, such an honor to be here today, and it's great to be back at the place where I really got my first introduction to architecture, both in terms of the physical form of buildings set within a stunning landscape, uh, as well as the academic consideration of what architecture is and how we interact with it. Um, it was here at UCSC that I took my first architectural history course, which opened my mind to thinking about our constructed environment uh, and how we build and design um, and shape the world in which we live, and how in turn our built environment shapes us. I wasn't really aware of the fields of architectural history and urban planning and historic preservation when I graduated. Um, the courses I took here for my history degree introduced me to the larger world in which we live and the kind of broad patterns of history that shaped our evolution uh, as a species bringing us here today. Um, and of course, I learned how to research, how to write, and how to gather information from multiple sources, both primary and secondary, uh, to distill my own hypotheses about a particular, about how a particular uh, historical event unfolded. And without a doubt, the skills that I learned here continue to serve me every day in my work. Um, but it wasn't until I started volunteering for a local a uh, small nonprofit historic preservation organization in my hometown a couple of years after I graduated that I stumbled upon the very thing that I was looking for, which was the idea of studying history, not just as a moment in the past to be considered and weighed and written about, but studying history to actually affect and shape the world that we live in in the present. 
So it was volunteering at this nonprofit that I began understanding that buildings, both the grand, iconic, high-style buildings, um, such as churches and courthouses and educational institutions, as well as the modest um, vernacular homes that most of us are familiar with, tell a story. Uh, they tell a story about the places in which we grew up. They tell a story about the people who inhabited them. They tell a story about how collectively our environment came into being and how social, political, and cultural forces have shaped that environment. I began researching uh, graduate schools and decided on the University of Virginia because, in my opinion, they have one of the most extensive architectural history programs in the country. And they also offer a certificate in historic preservation, which is what I really wanted to do, which was uh, to help preserve those buildings and landscapes that collectively tell our story. Story. I quickly realized in my first semester that in order to most effectively practice architectural history uh, and historic preservation outside of an academic setting, I needed to marry my education in these disciplines with urban planning, which is the conduit for how these uh, fields play out in a real world environment. So what is architectural history? Um, I tried to find uh, a good definition and wasn't really successful, so I'm going to try to explain it briefly with a few slides. Um, of course, my most recent experience has been living and working in New York City, so I'll begin there. Um, this is my brother's building located at 15th Street and 8th Avenue in the Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan. Interestingly, this building um, is actually a series of tenement buildings um, that were constructed in the 1880s and given a single unified wraparound facade designed in the Renaissance Revival style that was popular in the 19th century. Uh, without doing extensive research on the building, uh, it's my inclination that the developer probably wanted to distinguish their building from other tenement buildings in the area by giving it this more formal unified appearance. Uh, the facade is articulated with alternating rows of arched windows with keystones and windows with just straight lintels. Uh, decorative bands of stone unite the windows on the second and the third floors. Uh, I'm sorry, the second, third, and fourth floors, and then string courses, which are um, uninterrupted horizontal bands, usually of stone on the exterior of a building, are used to delineate the fourth and the fifth floors. Uh, the horizontal lines, um, well, step back a minute, these, these details actually really serve a purpose in terms of how you read a building. Um, the horizontal lines actually minimize the appearance of the building's massing by breaking down the components of the facade into digestible pieces. In addition, the repetitive rows of windows essentially guides your eyes along the length of the facade, allowing you to absorb the full length of the building in a rhythmic way that is pleasing to the eye. Alterations to the building other than the changes to the ground floor storefronts uh, include the replacement of all the windows and, and note the cornice has been removed. Um, removal of his cornices throughout New York was rampant in the 70s uh, and 80s, partly in, as a response to deterior, uh, deteriorated cornices that threatened to fall on pedestrians below, but also as a response to the popularization of modernist architecture, which more often than not shunned the use of ornament. Uh, so understanding all of these elements of a building that more often than not we don't really pay that much attention to is one of the key aspects of being an architectural historian, which is that you learn how to read buildings because they are your primary documents that you use to illuminate the cultural, social, and political values of the people who built and inhabited them. So moving inside the building, we see narrow, uneven staircases, essentially small passageways that would have been lit by gas lamps. You see large windows at the landings of each floor opening into air shafts that would have pro uh, provided air circulation in these common interior hallways, which is really important for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Um, we move into the actual unit and we see that only the front room has exterior facing windows to allow natural light into the apartment. The rest of the windows open onto interior shafts and provide very little light. The reason for this has to do with the tenement acts passed beginning in the mid 19th century. The act of 1879 required every room to have a window facing a source of air and light. In other words, a window that didn't just face an interior hallway. However, instead of doing what the law intended, which was to ensure tenants had access to fresh air and natural light, developers began constructing buildings with dumbbell-shaped floor plans, as shown in the map on the bottom right, uh, so they could create rooms with a window to comply with the law, but the window faced an interior shaft. Naturally, people started using the shaft to dispose of food waste and garbage, uh, which of course facilitated sickness and disease. This lit then led to the Act of 1901, which required buildings to be constructed around courtyards to allow for the more sanitary removal of garbage, and also that new buildings be constructed with outward facing windows in every room. So we fast forward to the 1920s and we take a look at my building at 22nd Street and 1st Avenue. Uh, the facade is much simpler, and again, you can see the cornice has been removed. Um, the stone clad base has an entrance with a classical door surround consisting of two fluted Corinthian piers supporting a very simple entablature. 
Um, but as you move into the building, you see the staircase is wider and straighter again as a result of more sophisticated building codes. Also, there are no windows in the stairwell because the rooms in each unit, I'll build, there are only two main rooms, um, but they both have exterior facing windows to allow light and air into the apartment. The footprint of the building, which you can see on the bottom right, uh, is also rectangular because it wasn't necessary to carve out space to create light wells um, uh, and because then they had exterior windows on both the back and the front of the building. So in essence, the developer could also then sandwich and smash the buildings right next to each other, thereby maximizing the allowable square footage on the lot and essentially make more money, which is of course the goal of most developers. Um, so, I mean, I could talk about buildings for days, but I really don't want to bore you. So, but I think these two house forms um, are, are forms that we're somewhat, at least for, somewhat familiar with. On the top left, you have the Josiah Dennis House that was built in 1735 during the colonial period in Massachusetts. Uh, this is a shingle-clad colonial Georgian house, and you can see it has a very simple uh, design. It has a side gable roof with a central chimney that would have been the primary heating source. The facade of the house conveys the interior layout of the rooms. You have a central entrance hall that's flanked by a living room uh, and a dining room, which would have been in the primary common um, spaces for both um, the family and for entertaining guests. Bedrooms are located on the upper floor and the kitchen is in the rear. Um, as it took a tremendous amount of labor uh, to harvest wood and turn it into a suitable construction material during this period, the house has a very simple plan and is almost completely unadorned. In contrast, the house on the top right is an ornate circa 18, uh, 1850s Second Empire Victorian house located in Santa Cruz on the corner of Highland and Escalona Drive. I used to live across the street from this house. Um, so by the mid 19th century, technological developments such as the mass production of nails allowed for more complex structures to be built. Since the Roman period, nails were made by hand. A blacksmith would heat wrought iron and fashion a rod to form a point, stick that rod in an anvil and strike the top until it formed a rose head, hence a rose headed nail. Um, obviously this process was very labor intensive. So by the early 1800s, a machine was designed to create cut nails, which literally cut nails from flattened sheets of metal. This new technology combined with developments in the milling of wood and the standardization of wood parts, such as the two by twos and two by fours that we're familiar with today, um, allowed for much more complicated floor plans, include, uh, including the cupola and the bay windows that you can see on this ornate, elaborate Victorian. So the proliferation of Victorian um, architecture in the 19th century, which was based on technological advances in construction, in turn shaped cultural and social values during this period. For instance, Victorian houses typically had more rooms than their 18th and 19th century counterparts. So we begin to see the the distinct separation of public and private space inside the home, as well as the separation of interior spaces along gender lines. It became common for men and women to retire into separate richly or ornate decorated rooms after dinner instead of the common living, living area where guests would have been entertained in previous eras. So we see technology driving methods of construction, which in turn drives building, how we build, which in turn shapes how we interact with one another. So moving away from individual buildings and zooming out to take a macro view, we see collectively how individual buildings as well as the natural landscape shape our built environment. For instance, a series of very simple house plans developed by a father-son business during the post-war housing shortage uh, whose parts could be mass produced allowing for the production of up to 30 houses per day uh, led to Levittown uh, in Long Island, New York. Um, Abraham Levitt, with his two sons, began purchasing potato and onion fields in the early 1940s in anticipation of this post-war housing shortage. Uh, the flat, undeveloped uh, farmland was well suited to, to carving out roads and laying concrete slab foundations on which these manufactured houses would sit. Uh, the first 2,000 houses were rented within two days of construction and it was allotted as a success in responding to the post-war housing crisis. By 1951, the Levitts had constructed over 17,000 homes for families in Long Island. Uh, and Levittown was the first mass-produced suburb in the United States and is considered the archetype of the suburban model that swept through the country during the post-war period. However, the legacy of Levittown in many ways is one of institutionalized racial segregation, environmental degradation, and an urban planning paradigm that is diametrically opposed to the healthy, vibrant, diverse communities that Long Island is struggling to build today. Early on, the Levitt firm switched from renting their homes to selling them, taking advantage of the Federal Housing Association policies that only offered mortgages to developers who constructed racially segregated developments. 
So buying agreements for homes in Levittown included a racial exclusion clause that stated that the property could not used or be occupied by any other person than members of the Caucasian race. The Committee to End Discrimination in Levittown formed in response to this federally sanctioned practice, and in 1948, with Shelley versus Kramer, the US Supreme Court determined that courts could not enforce racial covenants on real estate. While the ruling stymied the legal enforcement of racial segregation, the Levitts did not attempt to counteract segregation, which has had a lasting impact, not only on this community, but in several towns and villages throughout Long Island. According to the 2000 census, uh, Levittown is approximately 94% white, with a population of roughly 53,000 people, 3,600 are Latino, and 266 are African American. From an environmental perspective, Levittown's lack of master planning led to a disjointed network of primary, secondary, and terti tertiary roads connected to state and federal highways. Uh, there was no organized method of dealing with sewage in Levittown, and surprisingly, septic tanks weren't even used. Uh, instead, they used individual cesspools for each house, which quickly led to ground saturation issues that posed serious health risks. Mm -hmm. After serious protests from the Department of Public uh, public health, the federal government actually stepped in in the 1960s to install septic tanks. Um, however, unsewered areas and improperly sited septic tanks are persistent issues on Long Island today. Um, I think approximately 70% of homes and businesses are served by septic in Suffolk County alone, which is the larger portion of the end of, of uh, Long Island. So leaky septic tanks combined with chemical fertilizers have leached nitrogen into the groundwater since the rapid urbanization of Long Island began in the 1950s. Long Island sits on its own aquifer, so from a drinking water standpoint, uh, that's a problem. Uh, but the nitrogen that has leached into the bay, particularly in the last 10 years, has led to harmful red and brown algal blooms that have decimated shellfish habitats and completely destroyed the oyster fishing industry. My intent here is not to pick on, on Long Island. I'm very sorry, Bruce. <laughs> but, but, the, but the story of Levittown encapsulates so many of the issues that urban planners across the country are dealing with today, with it, which is essentially ethnically fractured, automobile-dependent communities. How do we turn these communities into livable, workable, walkable places that cater to a diverse ethnic po population as well as an aging community? How do we take an automobile-centric approach to transportation and incorporate sidewalks and bike lanes, bus paths, and walking paths to create an interconnected multimodal transportation that allows people to get out of their cars? These are questions urban planners in Long Island and across the country are creatively trying to answer by engaging with communities, working with local officials, elected officials, and then also working with local nonprofits. Most recently, I had the pleasure of working on the Suffolk County Comprehensive Master Plan, which hopefully will be the first one that they approve in decades, um, which is a 300-page document that identifies all of these issues, transportation, traffic, water quality, economic development, housing disparities, and outlines over 100 prioritized recommendations to create ethnically diverse, walkable, economically vibrant communities that serve all ages by providing sewer infrastructure, investing in educational institutions, implementing alternative modes of transportation, fostering agricultural industries, and working with regional governments to institute resiliency initiatives to protect Long Island, Long Island from the devastation caused by Hurricane Sandy. That's two careers. <laughs> now we'll go into third. Moving along to the field of historic preservation, in my opinion, historic preservation is born out of the intersection or collision of urban planning and architectural history. Historic preservation is defined as an endeavor that seeks to preserve, conserve, and protect buildings, objects, landscapes, and other artifacts of historical significance. It's a seemingly simple enough definition that belies the inherent conflicts when we begin to ask whose history are we preserving or whose history are we failing to preserve. How do we preserve buildings, i.e. history, in the face of necessary changes to improve our built environment, whether it's building more affordable housing, improving transportation systems, or rebuilding after a disaster? These are all questions historic preservationists contend with every day. We strive to peel back the layers of time when studying a building or a neighborhood or a city to understand the people who built and inhabited these places. Sometimes these places are sacred to only a select few who wage an uphill battle to get others to recognize their significance. Other times these places are sacred to many, and although protecting buildings and places from the bulldozer al almost always feels like an uphill battle, it is, it is helpful if there is the momentum of public support. Um, but in this way, historic preservation, uh, 
unlike urban planning or architectural history, really began as a grassroots movement, and it really very much still is today. Of course, the three-year demolition of Penn Station in New York catalyzed a movement that had already been brewing since the 1950s and ultimately led to the passage of New York City's Landmarks Law in 1965, which they're celebrating the 50th anniversary of this year. Um, Penn Station was designed by the prominent and prolific um, architect, 19th century architectural firm McKim, Mead & White. Um, the iconic station was arguably one of the greatest and most beautiful train stations built in this country at the time. But with the decline of rail passenger service in the 1950s, combined with the lack of maintenance, the Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania Railroad, who owned the building, optioned the air rights, uh, which included the demolition of the station to make way for what is now Madison Square Garden and the much derided underground Penn Station we have today. Of Penn Station's demise, Ada Louise Huxtable wrote, until the first blow fell, no one was convinced that Penn Station really would be demolished or that New York would permit this monumental act of vandalism against one of the largest and finest landmarks of its age of Roman elegance. Somehow, someone would surely find a way to preserve it at the last minute. Any city gets what it admires, will pay for, and ultimately deserves. Even when we had Penn Station, we couldn't afford to keep it clean. We want and deserve tin can architecture in a tin horn culture, and we will probably be judged not by the monuments we built, but by those we have destroyed. So following the establishment of the New York City Landmarks Law, the National Historic Preservation Act was passed in 1966, establishing the National Register of Historic Places, the, uh, national, the list of national historic landmarks, and then also state historic preservation offices, which are charged with reviewing state and federally funded projects to assess if any adverse impacts on historic or, archeolo or archeological resources would result from a project, and if so, provide mitigation. You may recognize some of these buildings. Um, on the bottom left, the Bank of Santa Cruz County. Most of the building was demolished, uh, demolished after the Loma Prieta earthquake, but two facades survive. Um, the Cowell Lime Works Historic District, um, uh, which dates to the mid 19th century and was used to quarry limestone to produce lime, which is used for making mortar for brick buildings. Um, this was listed on the Nat State and National Register in 2007. And on the bottom right is the Golden Gate Villa, uh, a late 19th century Queen Anne-style Victorian house that accommodated guests such as Thomas uh, Edison and Theodore Roose uh, Roosevelt. So while listing on the State and National Registers is honorific only, uh, localities across the country began designating historic resources in districts at the local level, which actually adds a layer of regulatory review that is more stringent than any federal or state uh, regulation. And this is where historic preservation gets interesting. The federal and state governments provide the framework or enabling legislation for individual localities to establish regulatory oversight of historic resources. In other words, Federal and state governments do not want to dictate to communities what buildings and historic districts they should or should not preserve. It is up to individual cities and communities to identify their own historic resources and choose to designate and protect them or not. So the field of historic preservation plays out in many ways at the local level, which can be fraught with competing interests from developers to property owners to neighborhood residents. As Tony Wood, a colleague and friend of mine, said to me when I started working in New York City, welcome to the fight. But it is an important fight to engage in. We are stewards of the buildings and landscapes that define and shape us as we grow and evolve in our respective communities. And we are responsible for passing along this heritage and environment to the next generation. So it is in our hands today to decide what does or does not get preserved. And it remains to be seen by future generations uh, whether they will laud or condemn the choices we make. So I'll just conclude with this slide to end where we began, and it seems fitting uh, in the wake of UCSC's 50th anniversary this year. It was at UCSC that my history, uh, interest in history and architecture were sparked, and it was my history professors, with whom I still keep in touch with today, who nurtured the critical reading skills, the research skills, and the writing skills that served me throughout my postgraduate education. Uh, these skills continue to serve me every day in my career, and I'm certain they will have an indelible imprint on my life's work, for which I am very grateful. That's all. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Any questions? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you're here today. This is a subject that has always interested me so much. Um, I'm very concerned about the fate of the post offices in this country. Um, we have one that in my town that's on the National Register and is a WPA 
<clears throat> is a WPA uh, structure, and it was damaged in the earthquake, and I don't think it's going to be a post office ever again. And um, in Berkeley, uh, there is talk about taking down that beautiful post office. Uh, what can we do to yeah. stop this? Um, yeah. um, well, you can do that. That helps a lot. Um, well, again, federal listing on the state and national register is honorific only, so there are no um, regulatory, there's no regulatory oversight. You can work to get it um, designated locally. I'm sure Berkeley has local historic district designation. They have local districts. Maybeck is a huge architect there. All of those buildings, I'm sure, are locally protected. So working actually with the planning department. That's your first phone call is to find out if it's actually locally designated, and if not, how can we go about doing that? Because local designation uh, of a resource, archeological or historical, is the only thing that can really stop the bulldozer um, from coming in. Um, and that in a tremendous amount of public support, I, that works. I mean, I have sat on architectural review boards and I can tell you that works. It works to protest, it works to to um, generate momentum and public support for the preservation. And the, I mean, we deal with so many questions in historic preservation because it's not about the museification of a building either. There's no purpose of keeping a building around just as a museum that's not via, viable in a modern and contemporary society or turned into something that can be useful to future generations. So another good thing you can do is work with local architects, preservation architects, to devise a plan, bringing a plan to your planning department to say, look, we have a viable use for this. It's not just sinking money into to something that would become a museum, but we can turn this into an indoor, look at that beautiful arcade. That could be a fantastic farmer's market. You know, you can bring in kind of ideas about how to retrofit a building, much like the Ferry Building in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, you, can, you can work with architects, and more and more this is becoming an approach to architecture, not only because it's the right thing to do, um, uh, that's my opinion, um, but because it's sustainable. It's more sustainable to keep buildings and retrofit them than it is to tear them down when you think of a building material waste standpoint uh, to you know building, scraping a site clean, and then building new construction. You're talking about a huge amount of energy consumption just from that process alone. So it's more sustainable. It's more green to, to retrofit buildings, to build around them, to incorporate the old with the new, and then you also have this new kind of uh, experience that's completely grounded in a local aesthetic or a local part of history. So I think this is, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, this was an uphill battle and a struggle. Honestly, the whole, you know, sustainability movement and kind of green retrofitting and energy conscious world that we live in today is actually helping us. For a while, historic preservationists were having to ally ourselves with environmentalists, and it wasn't a good fit. So, and then in the 80s, they allied with the developers and we got crushed and it became facadism. So now we're kind of finally approaching this place where it's like the sustainability factor is there, the economic viability, and people actually value these spaces and places because they realize that they have more character, they have more um, draw, they have more personality, and they're more grounded and makes people feel like they're actually part of a place. So, um, Hopefully that's not a very too long-winded answer. <laughs> In a sense, what you're doing is uh, trying to renew some cities. Um, I'm interested in whether you or how you address in your plan or in your work the problem of uh, the transformation of cities like Baltimore into urban slums. Uh, a city that in 1950 was just about 85% white is now African American, lost a third of its population, and so on and so forth. And of course, I want to know how you guys talk about Robert Moses in the office. <laughs> and those are large, big, long questions. So um, how do cities change? Well, the 1950s is a very interesting period in most of America's cities because you were dealing with that, urban renewal. You were dealing with um, federally sanctioned practices to designate large neighborhoods and swaths of land as um, derelict, 
um, and condemn and then tear down. Um, and so, and then with Robert Moses, particularly in New York, New York City, build highways through it, dividing and fracturing former communities. Um, so the whole urban renewal movement began in the 1950s based on 1940s US policy. Um, and it um, was probably one of the worst things, I think, from a construction building, city, urban planning, design um, thing that we've ever been through. And we're still reeling from the effects of that. We are absolutely still reeling from the effects of that. Whether it's the NYCHA public housing complexes, towers, Corbusier's tower in a park in New York City that he touted as the solution to, to housing, post-war housing shortages, um, that once built were abandoned essentially by the um, agencies charged with taking care of them. Uh, and they were also not left with any federal funding. NYCHA receives no federal funding. So they're essentially a broke organization taking care, care of the largest stock of public housing in the country in a single city. Um, so you had large swaths of both small cities. Virginia had a large swath of its um, central African American uh, community completely wiped out and paved over to build um, large big box, real, big box retail stores surrounded by a sea of parking um, in the name of, you know, improved urban design and, and, and it was the age of the mall. So white people started moving out of the cities because of the urban decay going on in cities. In, um, and then also there was the movement of African Americans from rural agricultural areas into urban city centers. So, you know, and that's even changing now as African Americans, you know, move out into the first ring suburbs and then you have the newest and latest generations of immigrants coming in and taking over those former places that, you know, it's always just a constant changing of, of ethnic hands. But I think there's a lot of discussion on how to deal with the legacy and effects of urban renewal. I don't think there are any solutions yet. Um, I can tell you just from experience of working in New York, one thing that NYCHA is trying to do, because partly too, the problem and what perpetuates poverty in these areas is that you keep poor people together, all in one place. There's no mix of affordable housing with market rate housing. There's no mix of culture. There's no mix of um, um, you know, income, income mix. So what NYCHA is actually considering, and it's scaring a lot of people, but they have large, because they have these large parked areas, because they are towers in a park, they have kind of large swaths of land that are used for parking. No one, dri you know, no one drives in New York City. So why don't we take and re we retrofit some of these large open areas and insert and do infill development of market rate and affordable so that you can start creating diverse, more diverse communities. And I can say that from a lot of public meetings that I've attended, this approach is actually supported by the NYCHA residents because their feeling is like, if nothing changes, then we don't change, and nothing changes for our children. So at least this might be a step forward in beginning to think about how we can connect more to the larger community, not only of New York, but just the larger population, and change just something about our neighborhoods, because nothing changing is worse than, you know, than whatever obstacles we might find moving forward. There's a lot of fear of dislocation and relocation again, but, you know, they've been assured that according to NYCHA, I'm, I'm not a spokesman for them, but they've been assured that they're not gonna be relocated, so as long as they're in place and then you know, introducing new uses, new park uses and stuff, then they're feeling like this might be a way to move forward and try to heal some of that, um, some of the mistakes that were made uh, during the urban renewal. In terms of Robert Moses, oh, you know, it depends on who you talk to. Um, he built a lot of parks. Um, it's funny, there, you know, every history is an ebb and flow, and how we perceive events of the past changes as we move forward. Um, you know, um, Gothic architecture, the term Gothic emerged in the Renaissance period as a derogatory term for the architecture that was built before it. Um, and the Renaissance revival, you know, Renaissance architecture was, you know, supposed to be the new thing, when in fact, Gothic architecture um, was some of the most innovative construction techniques since the Roman invented concrete. I mean, Gothic architecture, the foundation of Gothic architecture is how we build skyscrapers today. It's the same structural system of an exterior 
sheathing wall, and then you know you have these interior load-bearing I-beams, and you can have an exterior curtain wall that just allows you to build 50 stories. Um, the notion that that the whole notion of that is based on Gothic architecture, this incredibly innovative period that was derided for 200 years later afterward. So we history is an ebb and flow of perception, um, and S Robert Moses, for years, was was. You know, it was Robert Moses and Jagan Jacobs, you know, it was evil and good, evil and good. And I think that there's this revisiting of Robert Moses, uh, his life and his work. I mean, there's no doubt that there was bad, but does that cancel out all the good or any good? Or can we look at it more objectively and say, this did not work? This did work. I mean, he did so much that I don't think we can just condemn him to Machiavelli. Um, so. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Robert Moses. Um, who? Okay, he had an extraordinarily long career in New York, and he um, started off just like in uh, various. Um, and somebody else may be able to explain this better than than I. Um, I'm not a Robert Moses um, historian, but um, he started off in small um, kind of planning departments, worked his way up through the ranks. He was then head of like Department of Parks. Um, he was responsible for for a lot of the urban renewal efforts in New York City, kind of tearing down large swaths of neighborhoods uh, and building highways through them because he thought the car was the solution. He saw the car as the solution um, to um, to uh, um, to reverse urban decay. Um, and he built lots of parks, but he built lots of roads. He tore lots of neighborhoods down. And when he was planning a highway through Soho, Jane Jacobs, who is his arch nemesis in, in the historiography and the, 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 the legend and legacy of New York City, she started looking at individual neighborhoods and, and discussing um, the complexities of, of the urban exchange that happens on the street and how neighborhoods are so much more based on walkability and mix of uses and old and young working together, schools here, you know, just the kind of the vibrant dynamic communities are based on walkability and scale. And so she became the, um, she became that for the Soho neighborhood and other neighborhoods, and she won. She started winning, and Soho was saved, and it was actually one of the first historic districts designated in New York City. So she was a huge, became a huge force and vocal voice against the efforts of Robert uh, Moses, and he somehow rose all the way to the top to head, you know, like three or four different major departments with an incredible amount of money at his hands until everybody realized that, oh, maybe this is a conflict of interest, which is New York. I've never been to a place before where lead agencies can, like where an, an agency proposing to do a project can be their own lead agency. So essentially, they're approving their own project. Okay, that seems like a conflict of interest to me, but it's New York. So that's, in a nutshell, Robert Moses. <laughs> I have two, yes. Cynthia. Do American uh, preservationists and urban planners uh, still look to Europe as a source of information and also practical um, transformations, given the beauties and the burdens of European architectural heritage? It's a good question. Um, I want to say no, um, because I'd say the only model that some of our from some of the historic preservation work comes off of is. England, um, because you had the establishment with the Ruskin, John Ruskin, um, of the, um, oh gosh, you guys are really digging into some, some of my graduate work here, it's been a while. Um, um, so John Ruskin and, and the whole kind of um, um, decorative arts movement in the early 19th century, in 1899 it was established by, um, I'll come in his name in a moment, but anyway, it was essentially the first historic preservation or, um, this kind of organization that was founded in, in England, and um, they were really interested in preserving architecture, obviously, and very in a very, very pure way. Some of that carried over into the United States, but the historic preservation movements really started bubbling in the 1940s in New York, really coming to a head in the 1950s with a lot of large-scale demolitions of really important buildings. And it really was, I mean, it, again, it was this real grassroots movement, and it was, it was start, I mean, there's, there's great essays about 
little old ladies with blue hair and white tennis shoes because they were the ones, you know, well, I mean, you had initially the daughters of the American Revolution really looking to restore some of the presidential palaces that were decaying in the early 20th century. Monticello was a mess. Um, I'm sorry, Monticello designed by um, Thomas Jefferson or TJ as he's known in Charlottesville. Um, and, um, you know, it was a mess in the early 20th century. And um, so it was an odd couple that purchased it for like $30,000. And they were like, this is insane. And people were trying to give them money to help restore it. And they were like, we can't take this. But then the foundation started. And so, you know, there was a legacy of wanting to preserve America's great national history. And that, was, that came out of Daughters of the American Revolution and, and those kinds of early 20th century organizations. But in terms of like, what people deemed as just normal buildings or you know, civic centers or train stations, who really cares about that? It's not associated with a president. So, um, so I mean, I want to say no, unless you can think of something specific where, that I might be missing. I would just say for Jane Jacobs, when, I, when I've read her, um, even you know, not mentioning the Mediterranean, she understands how spaces work. Absolutely. Buildings. And I mean, that and that, that book, I mean, she lived, I think, in the Soho neighborhood, certainly below 14th Street. And I, I mean, from what I understand is when she wrote that book, she literally just sat outside of her window for days and days and days and days, um, months, weeks, just really observing literally the patterns of how people walk across the street and interact with one another. I mean, she is the founder of what we we think about today in terms of a mixed-use, economically vibrant, walkable community. Um, and it was through her powers of observation of just daily life on the streets of New York. That's how I understand. But, but it is absolutely European. I don't know if she ever directly made that connection, um, but it is absolutely based on a much more European model of living um, than we're accustomed to, certainly in the suburban post-war period of America. Aaron, you have a fascinating career, but it seems to me that very few of our undergraduates think of it as a possible career path. So um, I wonder if you could say something to our undergraduates about how, how to you get break a job? into the field, how you get a job. Those are issues they're thinking about at this moment. Well, um, I really, th I thought a lot about it. And while I was thinking after I graduated, um, you know, and I was serving fries um, for a couple years, trying to think, think. I mean, I went through real estate. I was like, can I travel? What can I do? Do I do um, Peace Corps? You know, I was, because I had so many interests in travel, history, architecture, how could I marry all of these varied interests and yet do something, um, do something in a real and tangible way with history? How can I get paid to be a historian? Um, and literally, it was the nonprofit preservation organization that led me down this road. And I realized as I was sitting there archiving boxes and boxes of newspapers and old clippings that they had and just scanning everything for them so that it was more, you know, archival, um, that as long as I was dealing with history, buildings, environment, um, as long as I was working in some capacity with any of these um, things, I could work in this field for the rest of my life because it would provide enough varied opportunity for me to do different things that I could spend the rest of my life in it. So, and I have jumped between fields. I mean, I've been an urban planner processing special use permits for large scale development projects, you know, trying to get developers to protect more trees or, you know, reuse this historic building in a new development. I've been a historic preservationist advocating doing that for buildings on, you know, streets and, um, you know, putting together large, um, large seminars or week-long, you know, preservation week events to try to bring awareness to local communities um, about, you know, the importance of historic preservation um, in creating rich and dynamically vibrant um, communities. Um, I've now work on the private side, which many, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the, the, um, you know, some people have opinions about the private sector. Um, <laughs> um, but I wanted to try it all. And I think that's, that's something is find what you're passionate about and never say no. 
And don't hesitate to volunteer because some of the greatest things I've ever been involved with came out of volunteer work and not getting paid for it and came out of just interacting with people, listening to their stories, learning from um, people in a wide multitude of fields um, and being engaged. 90% of life is being there, period. It's just showing up. And when you take the time to show up, especially if you're not getting paid for it, um, that speaks volumes about um, your passion and dedication to whatever it is you're doing. Um, and then after that, get very organized. Um, I, I'm afraid that you probably will need a master's degree, but, or two. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, honestly, I went into graduate school thinking I would do a PhD. I was going to do a PhD in medieval architecture. Then I realized I would never be employed in the United States. And I realized that the, the competition in Europe for those kinds of jobs, I, as an American, I never would stand a chance. So I realized, too, the, the nature of academia changing is, is radically changing. And the, the notion of tenureship and funding and to do everything you wanted to do is tenuous these days. And I, and I also realized that it's a life choice. Choosing to do a PhD is a life choice of you are in academia. There's, you know, it's, that's, that's your career. And I didn't want to kind of, I love my professors. You guys have outstanding careers. But I, I didn't want, <laughs> I didn't want to, that's not, I didn't want to do just that. You know, I wanted to do, I wanted to engage in, a, in, a, in, in the fight. I wanted to be in the fight. I love the fight. I find the fight interesting. I would go to public meetings just for fun. I would go to planning commission meetings and boards of architectural review meetings just for fun. Because it's the dialogue is interesting. It's what drives history. It's what, um, and, and being part of that um, to me is, is really exciting. Um, so I think finding what you're passionate about, because there are so many things you can do with history. I mean, there's art history. There's, I looked into that. I looked into being a curator. Then it, I realized it would take me um, going back to undergrad to get a science degree and then go get a master's. So I was like trying to find what was the most prudent, both um, from a personal standpoint as well as a financial standpoint. So. Um, and that's, you know, that's why Virginia was a great choice for me, because I could do two master's degrees for the price of one and a half. Um, because I could just cram everything together in three years, move through summers, and you know, and doing both of those masters to me has been the most um, uh, wonderful thing ever. Because when I, you know, historic preservation was light, especially during the recession, the urban planning was something I was able to really dive into and engage in that. And and so I've always been able to be very much employed. And I would also say that I would say marry whatever your passion is within history to something else so that you're more diverse and you're more multidisciplinary. The more diverse and multidisciplinary you can be, the more you can assist and the more that you can jump and have more options, the more options you will have to direct your own career. Wow. <laughs>